first and foremost, I want to express my heartfelt appreciation for all the organizers. Never have I felt so grateful for being part of the SIT community with so many talented students and community members. Thank you so much. <laughs> and I need to start with the images. And everybody knows the passing of Osama bin Laden associated with the image, images of the World Trade Center, Taliban rising in Afghanistan and Pakistan, drone attacks in Afghan, Pakistan and border area on the Pakistani side, not to mention the US-led invasion of Afghanistan. And I want to do some reflections, or in a sense in my heart, dialogue with people in this room mindful that this is a very emotional conversation, one that needs to be had. And I will speak not only as an academic, but as a practitioner who has held a number of discussion sessions, trainings, and dialogues in Washington and elsewhere in the US on the one hand, and also on the other hand, Pakistan with Pakistanis, Afghans, and as the as the introduction mentioned, in the Middle East as well. So this is, for example, from northwestern part of Pakistan several months ago. This is one of the most recent dialogues and trainings that I did in Washington together with my Pakistani partner. And I will basically address two things. One is to invite you to, get to together with me to reflect on the deeper and broader meaning of the death of Osama bin Laden. Use that as a point of departure to explore cultural, psychological, structural roots that gave rise to Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden as a presenting phenomenon. Second is to go beyond that and explore constructive non ways to respond to the phenomenon. And the image that you see is an image that you are familiar with. People rejoicing in front of the White House. When this happened, when the news broke of Osama bin Laden's passing, there was another movement taking place. From the border area of Afghanistan, Pakistan, people who support the Taliban movement, some may be supporting Osama bin Laden himself, Others are deeply resentful for the way in which the United States military operation took place deep within the territory of Pakistan without the acknowledgement, permission by the Pakistan state. That latter reason is the reason why there is a growing number of people now in Karachi and elsewhere in the southern part of Pakistan, Muslim clerics marching and demonstrating as we speak. Can I invite you, just for a thought experiment, to be sympathizers of Osama bin Laden? I heard some of you laughing, which is great. Because I'm asking you to do the unthinkable. Just for two minutes. Not to acknowledge or agree with what they did, but to simply understand. Okay, just to understand. One point of departure, I think, is to refer back to any number of many, many messages Osama bin Laden issued. This particular one was issued by Osama bin Laden in September, October 2010 in relation to five French citizens taken hostage in Niger against the backdrop of the French government banning the headscarves for French Muslims. Do you remember? Mm -hmm. So I'll simply read the, his message. Quote, the subject of my speech is the reason why your security is being threatened and your sons are being taken hostage. The taking of your experts in Niger as hostages while they were being protested by your proxy slash agent there is a reaction to the injustice you are practicing against our Muslim nation. How could it be fair, Bin Laden said, that you intervene in the affairs of Muslims in North and West Africa in particular, support your proxies slash agents against us. 
and listen to this, and take a lot of our wealth in suspicious deals, while our people suffer, people there suffer various forms of poverty and despair. What does this mean? Typical image Osama bin Laden conveys. Then I want to go back to the 911 image. I lost my high school colleague from Tokyo in the instant. So the, although I'm a Japanese citizen, I, this is a very emotional subject for myself. And I juxtaposed the image of the World Trade Center with the iceberg, intending to say that the violence is the most visible phenomenon. But what gives rise to the violence are the layers and layers of historical accumulation of cultural, structural patterns, influences, and behaviors that give rise to Bin Laden-like figure, Al-Qaeda-like phenomena. Does it make sense? So to put violence on the surface, maybe the invisible part is a conflict. What is a conflict? Read the messages of the hijackers. What are the targets they chose? Number one, they chose the World Trade Center, which to them is something that represented America-led commercial fundamentalism. Globalization of the kind that in their view, if not some of us, in their view is responsible for at least 100,000 people dying daily in the global south for all preventable causes such as hunger, malnutrition, preventable diseases. But not so many people in America juxtapose that image of commercialism with the localized image of gas and oil pipelines, these pipelines, coming from the Caspian Sea, crisscrossing the terrain, Pakistan, Afghanistan, with American, Argentinian, Russian, Turkish, Japanese, many, many companies during the Taliban regime of 1996 to 2001, shaking hands for commercial deals, which combined with opium trade and arms trade, enabled the Taliban regime to shield Al-Qaeda and other elements that gave rise to 911. Another target, Pentagon, religious symbol of American military hegemony. Juxtaposed with the image of the global spread of American military bases, the black or red areas represent the areas where either military bases do exist or hundreds sometimes thousands of American personnel are present, or otherwise their national military uh, you know, facilities being used by American uh, military personnel. Now, that, if you, if you pause that, to see, to connect that with the attack of the Pentagon, that sounds like a little bit of a stretch. But the symbol that they chose represent this kind of image, juxtaposed with at least six million people killed during the Cold War alone by CIA covert operations, according to former CIA agents. Now, what is a third target, which was meant to be attacked but was not attacked? White House, the shrine of American political exceptionalism. Under the guise of democracy and human rights, of the version which is not wanted in Muslim majority countries, at least perceived as such. But that image needs to be also juxtaposed with another political ideological mapping. And this one is a result of the research of Al Qaeda sponsored Arabic language websites, where Muslim scholars of influence inspiring Al Qaeda citing each other's work. Who is more influential than what? So if you look at, for example, those big red dots, those represent the most influential scholars and practitioners of their version of Islam. 
that are inspiring Al Qaeda led action. Where is Osama bin Laden? He's right here, this small dot. All the rest of the people are active and present. I have held a number of dialogues. These, for example, dialogues um, took place in northwestern part of Pakistan, mainly with the Pashtun people. And Taliban took advantage of their Pashtun affiliation. Listening to their voices emerges a resentment, but also the clarity as to those three forms of fundamentalism. Commercial, military, and political exceptionalism. Is there any way out? These people ha also have solutions. Some of the solutions have to do with the domestic matters of Af Afghanistan needing constitutional establishment, police reform. Others have to do with what is happening inside Pakistan in terms of civilian military relations. But the one I want to share with you today is a much broader context. One that is not propagated so widely in the United States, but so needed. That is Central and South Asian Conference for Peace and Security. What do I mean by that? If you look at all those several nations, Afghanistan, Pakistan in the center, Iran, Turkmenistan with lots of gas and oil as you saw, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, China, India, especially among those Central and South Asian countries, I see two things in common in terms of my dialogues. One is that none of the countries wants to become next Afghanistan to be occupied by the American forces, or for that matter, the West. So despite the tremendous distrust between, in the bilateral relationships between them, the desire to have freedom from occupation is one thing in common. I found. Second is that if you look at any of the bilateral relationships, especially Afghan-Pakistan relations, distrust is deep. But because of oil and gas pipelines, ethno-linguistic connection otherwise, they are so interconnected. None of those bilateral ties is able to prosper to overcome its own internal dilemma without the cooperation between them. That's a real dilemma. If there are sets of those dilemmas, as well as the freedom from Western intervention as a commonality, then what kind of image would emerge? I would say that we learn from the Helsinki process of 1972 to 1975, led by Finland, small neutral country that assembled 35 Cold War participants from the US camp, the Soviet camp, non-aligned movement, with three tracks of discussion as to how to move forward during the Cold War. And I'll talk about the tracks. But all those 35 countries from Soviet Union and America on the one hand and Vatican on the other hand were given equal status, rotating chairpersonship with respect to the three power tracks of negotiation. Security track applied to this particular regional conflict context has to do with assembling several, if not all of the countries, have multi-year multi process, loose regime formation, of discussing how to come up with realistic arms control, border control, locally based police mechanism, not to be overtaken by militancy. Economic track needs to put all the gas and oil pipeline interests on the table, as well as to mainstream the alternatives to opium and weapons based economy that has a predatory nature and impact on the youth, women, and children, and the most economically subjugated people. Third, cultural religious track, among, among other things, needs to mainstream the Muslim leaders who belong to the same tradition from which Taliban 
as well as at Sky.com, I met with some of them. They preach nonviolence, reject honor killing, beheading, get all the death threats as a result. Currently, they are isolated. Is there any way that the regional forces can mainstream them, protect them, as they go to the FM radio, preach against the killings of that nature? Is there any way the regional process, despite all the challenges I'm aware of, can mainstream that? So those are the visions that come out of dialogues. Now, what should we, I'm a Japanese citizen, but if you could include me, me into your, your <laughs> yeah, American civil society. What could American people do? What can we do? That sounds like a big political process. Is there anything that we can do in Brattleboro? I would say transformation of the war on terror and deepen the commitment to revolutionary partnership. What do I mean by that? I believe that more measured response to Osama bin Laden's death, for all those reasons I mentioned, should not focus on the personification of evil in Osama bin Laden as a person. It is historical accumulation of the structure and culture and psychology that gave rise to bin Laden-like phenomenon. Do you see my point? The more we rejoice and do that, the more we distance ourselves from the real roots that will keep producing bin Laden-like phenomena. I can tell you, if we continue this path, I am really concerned about the future of this country and the world, right? So I propose three things concretely. One, let's have the courage and audacity to define the killing of Osama bin Laden deep inside the territory of Pakistan as a failure. Not in a military tactic sense, but in a sense of America, this mighty country, having failed to mainstream nonviolent approach to overcome the structure in Russia. Second, even if the self-defense in theory may be justified, let's regret. Let's teach our children, like my son here, five years old, that the killing of somebody should be dealt with deep regret. Have the courage to say that. Otherwise, this soothing feeling of rejoicing will be transmitted from generation to generation to generation. Third, therefore, take all those messages and build 1,000 dialogues of revolutionary partnerships, starting with local communities, between the people who are unlikely to meet Muslim Christians, people from all walks of life. And on 9 one one the tenth year, can we see former military generals of NATO and the United States, former Taiwan generals standing side by side at ground zero? Victims of 911, victims of drone attacks and Afghan invasion side by side, issue a call for 1,000 dialogues. So that's my conclusion. Thank you very much. Tatsushi arrived.